everyone, I'm Roma Tunison, and welcome to Curated Conversations, the official podcast series of the Middle East's premier retail and consumer insights hub, Curated Middle East. Curated Conversations is a dynamic platform dedicated to bringing you insightful, high-value industry information that focuses specifically on the evolving landscape in the MENA region. Join us as we speak to some of the region's most prominent movers and shakers as they share their knowledge, experiences and stories to help you navigate all of the changes we face in the industry today. Hey everyone, welcome to the 10th episode of Curated Conversations. Today we're joined by Noman Ahmed and Ridwan Etoubi two of the sneakerhead masterminds behind the pioneering London-born sneaker consignment store presented by, which has just launched its Middle East flagship at Level Shoes in Dubai this month. Norman and Ridwan, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. It is our pleasure. How have you been? Good, good. Busy, but good busy given the, given the current climate. A lot of our peers and friends have often asked us, well, what, how are you guys so busy in a climate like this? But it's been good. It's been good. It's been promising. We've had a lot of plans we had prior to the pandemic. Uh, we continued on with those plans, uh, bar a few roadblocks on the way that slowed us down. But to be honest, we've just been um, powering through. Yeah, alhamdulillah. I, I think um, considering the pandemic, um, where everything has slowed down and, and there's so many health concerns, all our families and friends are well and healthy. And I'd like to wish all the, all the listeners uh, and yourself as well that that you are healthy and well and it remains that way. And as Naman said, that although many things have come to a standstill, we've just been ploughing away, making plans for for additional presented by concessions and pop-ups and stores. So it's been a very, very busy time for us. I can only imagine. You guys have been doing phenomenally. And I understand that right now you're gearing up for the launch of your third flagship, which is at Level Shoes in the Dubai Mall. I think we're all very confident they'll probably be the best. It was quite challenging to try to surpass the experience that we've got in our Percy Street London flagship store, but going into Dubai and literally having the opportunity to design a concept with all of the experiential features, um, everybody, everybody is really, really excited because I think, and I'm sure that Naman would agree with me, that it will probably be one of the best presented by spaces that, that we've created. And, and you know, I'd go a step further. It's probably getting, uh, quite notably going to be the best sneaker store within the region. Basically, um, Rama is going to be the best sneaker store in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, That's so very and, Dubai is, and Dubai is like our second home. We're, we're there every uh, every other month. Um, uh, we've got a place out there, and we visit with our families. So, so we so so it's literally it, it's a second home for us. So it's, it's only right um, for us to obviously put this much energy and passion um, into this project. I was actually going to ask you that. Uh, how did you choose Dubai? for the location of your third presented by store? Well, well, part of our um, strategy is literally to open in affluent areas. And I think from the outset, we've always had our eye on Dubai and it was always on in the planning that we do have to. It's not, not a case of if we will, but it was a case of when will we open in Dubai as soon as we've got a huge, huge customer base that does visit the London store that comes from the, the Khalij area. And again, Dubai, the, the glamorous city, the, the fantastic architecture, the style, the elegance uh, of many of the people that, that transit and live there. We, we just had to, had to open up a space in Dubai. And obviously with, with the location in particular, obviously Dubai Mall, one of the more notable shopping capitals of the world it's actually it's quite humbling to be recognized as one store that had a vision uh, on a side street in london now obtaining international recognition and and it's quite refreshing and and, and it's welcomed when we go especially in the gcc region and uae in particular where a lot of the visitors are 
are regular travellers to London, especially in the summer holiday time, and they do know the store. So it was it was literally um, a no brainer to um, execute in Dubai. Uh, although we have other key cities in mind, uh, but Dubai was definitely top of our list. Amazing. And I, I saw that you've already kind of dipped your toes in the water with an activation at Seoul DXB. Was that last year? Yeah, yeah, it was. That was last year. That was, again, just to give our followers and the community that continues to support us outside of London um, some energy uh, within their local market and just give them a feel uh, and a chance to have some physicality um, and connect with the brand. Um, we, we did a collaboration with Ben Bola, um, LA-based um, um, jeweler, and we, we created a uh, bespoke tracksuit uh, which was available exclusively in the white colorway only in Seoul DXB um, so it's pretty exclusive um, sales were amazing and again just to give something back um, to the community that have supported us despite not having a physical presence in Dubai uh, and that further just cemented it was almost like a segue into what we had planned um, going forward. And I think that that almost kind of confirmed our plans as well to, to open in Dubai um, for, from the positive response that we had from the local community and the turnout of high profile influencers to the concession space. That was just li literally the, the final nail where we said, well, this is a project that we definitely have to go ahead with. Were you at all surprised by the reaction or was it what you expected? I think the demand in the region, we know, has always had a strong appetite. And over the years, the appetite has become stronger purely because how the market has shifted, where sneaker heads has become a common, more commercial term rather than traditionally where it was seen as more of a niche. So now we've seen that the market really shift where, like I said, you, you just need to walk into an Emirates lounge. You're not looking at suits and formal shoes. You're looking at chinos and sneakers. So really the demand, especially in the GCC and UAE in particular, has always been pretty strong because Western influence has traveled to the UAE region. But more importantly, the product allocation within those regions is still pretty small uh, and restricted so the demand is way higher when the, the, the proportion is is very unbalanced in terms of um, supply and demand and it always is when it comes to exclusive items but in particular allocation with some of these to rare sneakers and streetwear is very limited in the region so to be honest when we had done a market analysis and we, and we looked further into the region it was clear to us it only made sense to serve um, the, the, the community there and obviously give options because there's no one out there that has a product allocation that, that we are quite confident in and obviously bring that energy into the region. I think what I was surprised at and I, and I think all of us over here when we first opened the, the London store um, we opened it with the idea that we're passionate about footwear, we're passionate about sneakers and streetwear. Um, we just wanted to represent, you could say, the UK culture of the side mm -hmm. of the market. Now, we weren't really expecting there to be a huge demand. It was literally a project that we'd done simply because of our passion. But as soon as we opened our doors and, and the overwhelming support from, you could say, the local community and people from overseas was just overwhelming. And I think for us, the timing was on our side. Um, I think that's when you could say sneakers and streetwear or streetwear in particular took a turn in the sense that it became more acceptable. And it was almost kind of crossing the boundaries between luxury and streetwear where the gap between the two had become closer. So for us, um, that's where the surprise laid. And, and after that, it seemed to be that everywhere that we went or everywhere that we would hold an event, uh, people would embrace it uh, and they would really enjoy the experience. They would really enjoy the the product offering and everything that came along with it. Incredible. And how do you suppose that you've managed to grow a physical retail concept at a time when e-commerce is kind of 
biting into traditional brick and mortar retail. Do you think there's still space for retail experiences in person? Definitely, um, especially in the luxury market. I think a, a, a an, an online consumer is awfully geared around price um, and it's geared around winning the consumer, um, around competitiveness. For example, if you're looking at the luxury market, we found with our consumers, they prefer to to come into a store, get human touch, be empowered with information about the sneaker industry. And you're talking to sneakerheads serving serving the consumers. So so it's very much like I want to come in, I want to understand the market, I want to wear the shoes, I want to try them on, I want to see how they look. So so you gotta remember a lot of the consumers now where we said sneakerheads was a niche, it's become much more commercially aware and people just want to be bang on trend but to do that they are very much opinionated and at the same time they take a lot on board with our sales staff so so really at a time like this because of the type of retail we focus on we focus on experiential retail and leading the consumer by emotion i think obviously based on travel restrictions and obviously the the reduced number in, in tourism yes that does have an impact but that has an impact because of logistics, not because of the demand and the appetite. I would tend to agree with Naman. Um, uh, I think the the online market is primarily focused on the product itself. You're not just walking into, you could say, a retail store and looking at items on the shelf. Um, I think the design concepts for all of our spaces is thought through thoroughly. And what we want is literally someone to go in there and look at some wow factors. And it's not just the pieces, but it's the interior design. It's the way that the sales assistants make them feel. It's the viewing of trainers or, or footwear that cost 30, 40, 50, a hundred thousand dollars, as well as all of the exclusive limited edition items. So it is very much. As Naman said, it's led by emotion and we'd like people to walk away. And whether they are a sneaker enthusiast or not, it will be a talking point that they can share with their friends. Definitely. And how have you curated the presented by experience for your Middle Eastern clientele? I understand that you actually create bespoke experiences for each market that you enter. So I'd love to understand what you've done within your Dubai Mall uh, level shoes store to cater to the clientele here. I think um, the clientele, it's very much about these signature pieces, um, looking at these pieces, which are one-offs. It's always, it's always about having something that no one else has got. Um, we have a pinball machine that's valued in, in excess of um, $100,000. We have a, a drum kit. So these are one-off pieces. We, I don't want to say too much because we have got some grand reveals happening upon launch, but it's generally around the product offering but more importantly when the consumer walks in because of the heavy projection mapping we have positioned around the store we could change the store look overnight just by color scheme and that can be done digitally so it's all about newness a big pastime with especially within the region is shopping and visiting malls so we don't want the consumer to visit the space again and again and see the same things so it's very much about changing the space making sure that it almost looks like a gallery so you can walk in how people view art galleries we want sneakers showcased and tell a story and a timeline but more importantly it's important for us to educate the local communities and bridge the gap between what's available in the west but we're going to make it available in the local region but do it in a way that, that that's friendly and what they're comfortable with I know that in London and in Paris, you've positioned Presented By as a consignment store. Is it going to take the same format over here? Correct. Um, so it's it's going to take the same format in regards to the source of the products on sale. But in terms of consignees dropping off items within the store, that feature won't be available. Uh, it won't be available straight away. Um, there may be scope um, for an off-site consignment intake center, which we will monitor uh, based on demand. But based on our extensive network of consignees, we have 
have all over the world, product allocation for us is an issue. So every single item passes through our UK warehouse because it's very important. It passes through our authentication center where we have a team of authenticators and spe- sneaker specialists and streetwear specialists that really analyze and inspect every single item that's consigned to verify it's authentic. It is logged in our system. It has an RFID chip placed on it so it can be tracked and then it hits retail stores. So although um, logistically it seems like everything moves around quite a lot, uh, it's it's precedence to the brand and the trust consumers have given us, um, that's something we won't risk or fast track. So having consignment locally uh, may be an option for the future, but it's not going to limit us in terms of uh, product availability. I think that that's always a challenge um, and a concern for us is, is uh, the authentication of items. The product offering it is relatively easy to provide, but again, if we're opening up um, different service or fulfillment centers across the globe, then we need to get highly trained authenticators who are able to authenticate items from Nike Footwear to Adidas to LV Supreme. And uh, I think that that skill set isn't easy to find. So we're, we're more comfortable with it being controlled and managed over here in the UK at this moment in time. Uh, I think given the appetite for our products in the Middle East, um, as we scale up, then we'll definitely be looking at opening a fulfillment centre over there. And can I ask who your consignees tend to be? I was really curious. So um, when I was reading up about you, your model, and where do your sneakers come from? Who's your typical consignee? Um, well, well, there's different breeds of consignees. Um, you, you have some guys who, who we consider them as professional consignees who, who work full time on this and they literally are able to access and consign hundreds of pairs of stock. Uh, and it's unbelievable sometimes. And we do inquire, like, where do you get these from? And everyone has got their different avenues as to where they get the stock from. So you have professional consignees who probably consign in the region of £100,000 a month, sometimes more. Then again, you have people who are just part-timers who on occasions are school kids who instead of doing or working during the weekend or in the evenings would occasionally buy items from the Adidas or Nike stores and they're quite happy to consign them with us. And then again, you you have people who just consign um, occasionally, uh, maybe once or twice a month, but it really, really does vary. I think the bulk of our consignees, 20% of them are probably professional consignees, and the ages vary between 18 to 35. Then again, you you have the part-timers who who are probably between the age of 14 to 18. It's a mix of people. Wow, you have an incredible network, huh? Yes, and um, I only wish they were all easy to get along with. (laughs) Don't we all? Because I think some of the prices that they demand or dictate are astronomical. You you literally have to turn around and negotiate with them and say, well, well, look, this target price that you're asking for is far, far too high. We try to control or at least reduce the prices. So at least that way our consumers are able to, to, to... buy items at a reasonable price. But again, it's always dictated by the consignees. It's literally a world I knew nothing about. It's so interesting. So I know we're short on time, but I'm really intrigued about your journey and your perspective on retail overall. You started Undercover River Brothers in 2012 and have since then dedicated yourselves into reimagining the sneaker industry. First with Crep Protect, which transformed something as simple and boring as footwear protection into a cool ritual that pretty much everyone wanted to be a part of. And then you went ahead and you disrupted the sneaker market again with Presented By and Collect. Could you tell me a little bit about your background and where this love for sneakers comes from? Um, I think it's just um, purely led by passion. You don't need to have an expensive array uh, of sneakers and you don't need to have a massive collection of sneakers to be classed as a sneakerhead. Um, sneakerhead, um, that 
terminology is is often just led by passion um, for the industry. We we only bought sneakers what we could afford growing up. I was quite lucky to be the same size as my brother Imran, <laughs> um, and and we used to share sneakers. Um, um, and then and I used to clean them up before you got home from work. So for us, it was purely led by the passion for always wanting the latest sneakers. And myself and my two brothers. Um, so it was myself, I'm the youngest, and there was Imran Ahmed and Rizwan Ahmed. And we were very much focused around fashion, the trends, uh, and sneakers, essentially. And that's where, essentially, Crep Protect was born. Um, it was answering a question that we had for the industry where we couldn't really trust for any sneaker cleaning products to be applied on our sneakers. So we created the brand Crep Protect, and we were very clear from the outset that we were going to create a brand that's premium. We wanted sincerity. We wanted to not just create a product, but we wanted to create a whole industry uh, and, uh, and own a category, um, just like Red Bull uh, owned the energy drink category. So it was very clear for us from the outset, we're going to create products that are bought, not sold. And to do that, we really needed to understand the consumer and position the brand very focused around the sneakerhead. And that's what we did. Traditionally, again, the sneaker cleaning industry is no secret. It's been around for many, many years, uh, but it's almost a, an industry that was ignored. It was an industry where there was no sincerity, you know, brand loyalty. You will walk into a sportswear giant, um, you almost buy um, your push sole um, sneaker care at the counter when you're about to check out. Um, you buy it because you almost feel sorry for the guy behind the till. You go home, you <laughs> throw it underneath your bathroom sink and there's no, there's no sincerity, there's no loyalty. And there's no follow up. Um, I'm laughing because that's happened so many times. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So it was very clear for us that we wanted to change that. We wanted to create sincerity uh, within the market. Uh, And to do that, how do we do that? And the way we did that, we worked outside in rather than inside out. And by that, I mean we wanted our consumers to be very aware of our product before they hit these sportwear stores. So we created Crep Protect. Crep Protect then instantly became. Um, a worldwide phenomenal. It became, uh, we now distribute in 52 regions worldwide. We sold uh, 16 million units last year. We continue to, we continue to grow significantly within key regions. And for us, what was, what was actually really humbling was the fact that Crep Protect um, in the UK was classed as the second fastest growing business in 2019. And that for us was was a massive achievement because we're talking Shuka here. Uh, and often we get, how exciting can Shuka be? When we started this venture, many people said, good luck with that. I hope it works out. And it was, it's often seen something that you'll do part time or, or why would you want to do that? I, I was a qualified aircraft engineer. And then I moved into this space purely led by passion. Uh, we continue to grow to this date, but again, we grew with the demand and commerciality of the market. Um, the sneaker industry continued to grow significantly and we allowed ourselves to ride that wave, but also answer the questions of, of, of the sneakerhead. We then transitioned into presented by purely because we had extensive network within the market. This was a passion ourselves, being sneaker collectors ourselves. We we saw there was a gap. There wasn't a, a sneaker consignment store that offered that luxury experiential retail, uh, which we believe was lacking in the industry. Um, again, every industry we go in, we want to disrupt and, 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 and innovate. And this is where we call in some reinforcements and, uh, and we called uh, Ridwan to join the team to really head that vision that we had uh, globally is again you're looking at can seek and consignment stores again no 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 secret that's been happening for a while predominantly in the US market but again we wanted people to walk into our stores and be taken back by the experiences be, be spoken to more like a help desk rather than a sales desk 
um, empower our consumers with knowledge, which we've actually opened up a world which was alien to them. So really, that then allowed us to then focus on, on, on our space rather than just stacking product and focusing on volume. We wanted to focus on experience and really driving that luxury premium nature of what we try to do with our brands. Can I ask a question? You seem very meticulous in the manner in which you have expanded within the industry. And it's quite strategic. It just, it makes sense. And what I love about your ideas is that you would think that someone would have thought of it, but no one did (laughs) until you guys did, you know, like crap protect. And then it comes to the model for presented by and collect. They're not brand new concepts. They're just never done properly, isn't it? I think what it comes down to, I think when people think about business, they, um, a lot of it's more focused around revenues and financial strains. And for us, it's when we, when we go into a space, we're here to build a brand. We're here to build a brand that really connects with our consumer. Uh, but more importantly, that gives us longevity, um, in the space. Uh, every day, the ethos we run in our HQ is if it's going to build brand equity, we go and do it. If it doesn't question yourself, why are we doing it? Uh, And that always, always takes precedence for us. Uh, We call ourselves a marketers uh, before anything. And for us, it's about creating concepts and and innovative ideas. Uh, And and a lot of people will say to us, how innovative can Shuke be? And we've proved it. When people think about shoe care we want crap protect to dominate their minds and how we do that is an often challenge for us is to come up with newness every single month and every single week and so if you even look at the the age demographic in our HQ is significantly lower than, than a traditional business and I think that for us it's focusing on the finances um, um, totally and doesn't work for us because that overshadows um, the vision um, um, and the longevity of what we're trying to build in terms of a successful lifestyle brands. But essentially, that was the vision. No, no, I, I was just going to say, and I, I think the success of Cryptotech um, allowed, presented by the freedom to represent itself the way that we wanted, um, in, instead of being restricted by how much money is this business going to make? Is it going to make money? Um, let's forecast and project figures for the next two, three, four, five years. Instead of focusing on the financials, we just wanted to represent what the sneaker community was lacking within the UK and to enjoy ourselves. And I think because of that drive and because of that passion, based on our own taste, it seemed that many, many other people shared the same taste as us. And just to add, as a group, we remain independently owned. Um, we're not, we don't have any external shareholders or investors. And that for us, it's a big deal that allows us for speed to market, make decisions, make unorthodox decisions where we'd often, often be challenged by a traditional business model. But in fact, if it feels right for us, um, who says we need to follow a traditional path? We make our own trail. And that, that I was going to say, the, if you're looking at conventional kind of shoes and brogues and uh, Oxford's um, brogues, then they are conventional. Um, I think nowadays people are more comfortable wearing footwear and sneakers and, and jeans and shirts to work. I, I think the trends have, have totally changed and we've literally been bang on cue in, in introducing Presented by to that. And for me, why I like trainers is... They're more comfortable. I simply didn't want to wear shoes at school when I was younger. I remember I used to sneak them into my bag and try to change them yeah, in the classroom. Yeah. Um, and and we always try to look for loopholes and yeah. say, "Yeah, but, but miss, it, it's all black." Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, for us, it's again looking at traditional retail. You, you you buy stock. You buy to you buy stock enough for ten weeks cover. If it doesn't sell, it moves. It moves into clearance. And for us, it's, it, it's you buy stock. Then the more the more stock you can sign, the longer you hold on to it, the value often increases. Yeah. So it's really unique way what would you say is the importance of your partner retailers in other countries holds in translating this vision for you for example in paris we retail within bon marché and then in dubai you have level shoes is there a particular reason you've chosen these retailers to further your vision for presented by 
Um, I think it comes down to how we've positioned ourselves. Um, as Lamar said earlier on, there are many, many consignment stores, uh, predominantly in the US, and th there is no real luxury positioning. We want it to be an affluent premium space where people can literally walk in, whether they want to shop or whether they just want to view the items. And this is why we've partnered with, with the likes of Le Bon Marche uh, and Level Shoes, because again, we share the same clientele, the, the clientele that do like the finer things in life, that do want limited edition and exclusive items, that do want to stand out for, from amongst their peers. And, and these are the exact types of products that we offer. So I'm going to go into my last question, which I've been dying to ask you. Fire away. How many sneakers do you own? <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine are scattered around all over the place. I've got some in the office. I've got some at the stores. I've got some at home, some in the car. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, but but, but <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm not talking hundreds, less than 100. <laughs> The pair that I've got on at the moment are a very modest pair of Nike Air jewels, but they're customized because they've got presented by on the sole. Um, and I wish I could show them to you, but no, my, my trainer sneak account is less than a hundred. I would say easily. I would say mines are in the hundreds only because I refuse to throw any of them away. I, I refuse to throw anywhere. Not to say I wear all a hundred and I'm always under pressure at home to um, get rid of some, but it just accumulates. We've been lucky enough to be sent sneakers by the brands as well. So we're quite lucky um, in that sense, but it, ha it does accumulate over the years significantly. And before you know it, I haven't done that exact count, but I'm sure next time we speak, I'll, I'll give you that. I look forward to getting that answer from you. When are you coming to Dubai? Well, we've penciled it in for around the 9th of December. I will definitely see there. So it goes to plan then. Yes, we'll, we'll be making um, quite a bit of noise during that period. Oh, I'd love to join that noise. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much for your time, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. And um, really excited to experience presented by at Level Choose Dubai Mall and uh, meeting you guys as well in December. Thank you. It's a pleasure talking to you. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, please make sure you hit subscribe and leave us a comment below as we would love to hear from you. Also, be sure to head over to www.curatednow.me and sign up for the official Curated Middle East newsletter. Thanks for listening.